Okay, can we begin, please? going to do a discourse on the office of God. Um, so, um, my name is Russell Berman. I've been the editor of the, the journal for uh, the past uh, few years. I've just stepped down, leaving it to David Pan to continue. Uh, I'm sure he'll do a great job. Um, the um, conference so far has been really excellent. Uh, but before I proceed with anything else, I'd like to ask us all to thank Mary Picone. Without her, yeah. yeah. without her generosity and dedication and really love for this community, none of this would be possible. So thank you, thank you, uh, uh, Mary. Um, today it's uh, an honor for me to. Uh, introduce uh, Eugene Rivers. Um, Eugene and I have lived lives that have sometimes intersected, sometimes yes. entwined, well, sometimes short, gone in different lives, ways, yeah, right, right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> are continuing to live those, yeah. those lives. Yeah. Uh, if I try to think about uh, how our, um, where that similarity uh, but extraordinary difference uh, 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 where that led us, it leads us, I think, to the statement that I made to few of you that, uh, to my mind, um, you know, religion is sort of the critical theory of the moment. That's right, that's right. Um, that, was, yeah, that's, that's that, that, that comes, it's easy to say, um, it's hard to swallow in a very secular culture. Um, it's really only the beginning of a discussion because uh, uh, there's some extraordinary difficulties associated with that. Where is the politics? Where is the religion? Uh, where is uh, politics fair to religion? Where is religion fair to politics? And there are lots of different answers. But it's a really important field for us to explore, and I'm happy that Theolis has been exploring it for a, for a while. Um, Eugene has um, been able to bring his uh, extraordinary intellect, his um, uh, Irrepressible charisma. Don't keep it short. My ego thanks you. His uh, extraordinary intellect, his, uh, his irrepressible charisma, his uh, capacity to interrupt, uh, uh, to, to, to have led a, uh, a really, a, to be leading a really exemplary Christian life, doing hard work in, in, hard, in hard neighborhoods. Um, from uh, Dorchester to, as you just heard a moment ago, to Chile. Maybe he'll talk to us a little bit about uh, Jamaica. It'd be interested to hear that. Sure. Um, but um, I'm delighted that he's uh, part of the Tilos family and has been uh, for for a long time. Um, Eugene F. Rivers III. This is where it gets That's long. What was it? I thought we finished it. No, no, no. <laughs> Co-founder and director of the Seymour Institute for Black Church and Policy Studies. I remember this being recorded. So I got it. I got it. I got it. I'm with you. Pastor of the Azusa Christian Community Church. Co-founder of the Boston Ten Point Coalition. From Boston here. And co-chair of the National Ten Point Training Institute. Gene, thanks for being here and for talking to us today about religion and the intellectuals from Partisan Review to Telos. Yes. Welcome, Gene Rivers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm uh, especially happy today because I have the extraordinary good fortune of spending uh, some time with my daughter, uh, Sojourner Rivers. I, I have to do that. <laughs> uh, who is in her own right a brilliant intellectual uh, and a blessing to her mother and her father. I uh, first would like to express my deep appreciation and thanks to uh, Russell Paul Piconi, who has influenced my life for so many years. Uh, and by extension, I want to thank you, Mary, uh, for the amazing witness that Telos has been for me since 1973. And it has been 
a source of philosophical and theoretical inspiration, right or wrong. Because even in cases when Telos didn't get it perfectly, it always got it, it got it wrong smartly. <laughs> <laughs> so even when they were wrong, right? And I have in mind uh, one uh, particular uh, edition of Telos, uh, the value of which I was not quite clear with the essay on the, you'll forgive me, saints, the phenomenology of fucking. <laughs> which was, yeah, oh, that, that's how far back I go, right? So, <laughs> and uh, I was sort of mystified by that, but I said, okay, this too shall pass. And I, <laughs> so I, I'm very, very thankful. Um, my remarks uh, for the next 40 minutes will consist of a series of reflections on the relationship between religion and the intellectuals using as sort of a benchmark a uh, publication of a partisan review special edition on religion and the intellectuals. Uh, what is uh, interesting in looking at this special edition in 1950, uh, February, March, April, uh, William Phillips and Philip Rav, who were the commissars that uh, guided uh, this uh, very talented collection of intellectuals that led the anti-Stalinist, quietly Trotskyist left in New York City. And so it was a, a largely Jewish intellectual community uh, who were very cosmopolitan in the way that insular parochial intellectuals in New York can only be. <laughs> Where you are cosmopolitan, right, but completely homogenous, theoretically endogamous, uh, and uh, just an amazing group. Uh, in the opening editorial, let me turn this light on. It doesn't work. Okay, I'll make it. Uh, uh, Rob and Phillips assert the following. One of the most significant tendencies of our time, especially in this decade, has been the new turn toward religion among intellectuals and the growing disfavor with which secular attitudes and perspectives are now regarded in not a few circles that lay claim to the leadership of the culture. There is no doubt that the number of intellectuals professing religious sympathies, beliefs, or doctrines is greater now than it was 10 or 20 years ago. And that this number is continually increasing <coughs> or becoming more articulate. If we seek to relate <coughs> our period to the recent past, the first decades of this century, then the last century, begin to look like decades of triumphant, or I would choose the term Promethean, triumph in materialism. And if the present tendency continues, the mid-century years may go down in history as the years of conversion and return. In this comparison, we notice in particular, that whereas a long time modern thought envisioned a future society that could and would exist without religion, it presently, presently many thinkers sound an insistent note of warning that Western civilization cannot hope to survive without the reanimation of religious values. Now that's just an interesting formulation. 1950, uh, what's obvious is that the Second World War is not some of the starch out of the hubris of the West who began the 20th century with these Promethean fantasies which were simply amplified 
by the hubris and presumptions of Western society and Western civilization, uh, especially in relationship to the majority of the world. And so what is striking in this formulation is that Rav and Phillips recognize that to some extent they've been humbled. How the hell did what we just came through happen? We're looking at the beginning of the 20th century, and there was this presumption. You know, the imperial empires are expanding, there's unlimited success, there's extraordinary industrial growth. You know, America, you know, is at the top of their game. You've got Teddy Roosevelt, who's certain he's going to conquer the solar system in his first term. And so there is this remarkable period. Uh, and there are a couple of things I want to uh, suggest as we have this conversation about religion and the intellectuals. Because in the, the framework established by Rob and Williams, uh, they're not talking about the black intellectuals in Harlem. Uh, my suspicion is that from their offices, they couldn't find their way there. So there was not much chance of them being able to enlist the intellectual services of a Richard Wright or a Ralph Ellison or a Langston Hughes. So their perspectives on religion and the intellectuals <laughs> was a fairly homogenous affair. And so we have something going on. Um, uh, Sidney Hook, um, Hannah Arendt, uh, and all of the celebrity intellectuals that passed for celebrities, all 29 of them, <laughs> in 1950, uh, for the most part, are not sources of, uh, in this case, profound intellectual sagacity. They're surprised and shocked. Uh, what's interesting is that Rob and, 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 and Phil, uh, uh, Phillips understand there's something else going on. There's something new going on, and we're shrewd enough to put our thumb on this development. A few years later, reiterating uh, in, a, in a different context, uh, the Democratic Socialist Irving Howe, founding editor of the Socialist Journal of Dissent, would lament and condemn what he argued was the conformist sensibility of the American intelligentsia during the 50s in the midst of uh, McCarthyism and the Cold War. Now, those of you, uh, most of you are not old enough to know any of this. Uh, I am 120 years old, so <laughs> I was a young thing at the time that these developments were taking place. And it was an absolutely terrifying time. If you're in New York intellectuals, you've got the FBI, Hoover's on your heart, McCarthy's got everybody ginned up, and there were all of these amazing hearings where people were dragged in before Senate committees and harassed. Now, so, so, so how is quite correct? in understanding this, but there was a logic and a reality. And this is interesting. In retrospect, you know, if I've got the FBI, uh, the, the Committee on Un-American Affairs hounding me, there's a reason to be scared. I could lose my job, you know, uh, and, and there was the real issue of intellectual sympathizers with Stalinism. There were Stalinists during this period. Now, of course, that's exaggerated, but that fact was real. Now, ladies and gentlemen, mid-1950s, Irving Howe weighs in. The entire dynamic and understanding of how we conceive of the relationship between religious, religious phenomena and intellectuals changes. Had you read the American Political Science Review the same year that Dissent ran its series, 
in the American Journal of Sociology and took the volume for that year and looked for any essay, article, book review that suggested that the United States was about to go through a remarkable uh, transformation in its understanding of itself as a result of the initiative of what could only accurately be described as a, a clerical intelligentsia. And this is significant because you have a group of clerical intelligentsia, all highly educated. And see, part of the racism of, the, of most of the conventional historiography is that people do not tend to describe Martin Luther King and Andy Young and, and Byron Rushing and all of the other clergy for what they were. These were all highly educated individuals with seminary theological education and who by every possible definition were intellectual, intellectuals who were engaging in a political project. <coughs> this is very powerful. So in our discussion about the, you know, the, 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 the various transformations of the relationship between religious phenomena and intellectual life, one of the most powerful developments in the 20th century that involves a connection between intellectuals, individuals concerned with the uh, production of ideas and values, and religion is about to emerge, and no one predicted the possibility that such an occurrence could take place in some place called Montgomery, Alabama. Really? Think about it. This is important because if we must expand our understanding of the nature of you know, intellectual life. Martin Luther King, 26 years old, you know, with his BU dissertation, you know, right, who, who comes to Montgomery basically to pastor for a few years and wants to go get a comfortable college job. He had been offered a job by Mordecai Johnson, turns it down, comes to Montgomery, uh, to, you know, to make his bones as a good preacher and then go about his business. Here we have a dramatic shift in the nature of this relationship so that King and these intellectuals embark upon one of the most extraordinary and heroic adventures in the history of the 20th century and in many ways is comparable in terms of its moral power to what happens with Lincoln. There's no other major period in terms of the idea, not of race. King is talking about expanding the parameters of democracy. So in some very fundamental sense, his political theology, which here again is rarely credited when we talk about King, He's a local black preacher. We're we going to sing the song. We're going to talk about the dream and completely disconnect ourselves from the genius of the ideas that animated the transformation of the American South and facilitated the dismantling of apartheid and, 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 and the turning over of terrorism by any possible definition. That's a hell of a thing. And King was not credited for the genius in a new volume that has been produced by a protege of mine and a friend of Sojourners, Brandon M. Terry and Professor T Tommy Shelby, both of Harvard. They produced a majestic volume, a collection of brilliant essays on the political philosophy of Martin Luther King. And I, you'll, 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 you'll be yes, yes. Let me show you the line. I do this. Guy. <laughs> Pardon me for a rich commercial. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't get any money for this, right? But, but, I want to challenge Telos. I'm here because I think that Telos, the culture, the ideas, the movement intellectually, have, is one of the most important, if not the most important, journal of social and cultural theory. And there are these strategic opportunities and I, I'm, I'm going to slide into a little Bible thing here, right? In the New Testament, there are generally two terms for time. 
The first is Kronos, you know, what time is it? You, you, all, you, you fancy people, right? But then, <laughs> there's the more interesting conception of time, and we, we black preachers work this thing, right? right? The more interesting conception of time, which is that, you know, Kairos. There's Kronos and there's Kairos. And when the black preacher finishes with Kairos, right, he's got people running around the church tearing off their shirts. Because what he says is that Kairos is more pregnant with meaning than simply what time is it as in chronology. Kairos is that point at which crisis intersects with opportunity. And for us, we, we, the, then we take it to the next level, right? And he says at the point at which there's the intercession, we have a divine intervention at that center point where God's power breaks through and is able to transform tragedy into triumph. Mm -hmm. Everything. Mm -hmm. And you see, it's that language, that creativity, that imagination, <coughs> which would inspire peasant people to resist the terrorism of the American apartheid system and the intellectuals must return and recapture, not idealizing, not exaggerating, not making false claims, not giving simplistic, you know, historiographic narratives that get the facts wrong. Let's look at my man here, right? No, no, that gets the story straight because we are now in a period of history that is in some sense unprecedented. And the intelligentsia, the high paleoliberal intelligentsia, are the idiots that they've always been. And, 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 and there's no real news here. I tell my conservative friends, right? Yeah, I'm not a much little conservative intellectual around, right? So I, I'm sharing this with someone. I said, listen, if the smartest thing that you conservative, conservatives can say is that liberals, as a rule, are bad people, I said, you've got an IQ of five. <laughs> because it takes no imagination to observe the obvious when it's in your face and unavoidable. And so what I'm suggesting, here again, the relationship between religion and intellectuals now must step into another phase as we advance with a new philosophically rigorous intervention, this post-secular term. And it must be conducted at the highest levels. And, and part of that in terms of religion intellectuals, is dealing with the question of race. And here again, this is not the uh, point in the lecture where I pull out my whip and I start swinging around and the white people fall down and I look for guilt and they look for absolution as the black guy does a Mau Mau routine, vintage 1967. We're not doing that. Coach, I did that for you. <laughs> religion and intellectuals. Religion and intellectuals. It is now absolutely imperative that the smartest elements of the left engage in a sophisticated interrogation of the nature of white supremacy, which is much more complicated than most people imagine. I have enormous empathy for working class white people who don't like me. I've got complete empathy for those guys, right? You know, I saw the sashay around, which is what they, looking like this, and I go in and I get my mocha coffee, not really, right? My coffee and my Wall Street Journal and the Times, and some poor working class white dude who just got off opioid, that was working on a construction site, and lost his job because he fell out with his girlfriend because she didn't like how he could. I have complete empathy for that as a Christian. I want, I want to get to uh, one of the most ingenious things about that intellectual Martin King. King had enormous empathy for those poor whites. And what's interesting about intellectuals, they, and, and this just came to me, right? You see, King is a product of the South. He has an intuitive grasp of the sensibility, the psychology, the sense of frustration associated with being poor whites. You'll love this one. You'll love this contrast. Stokely Carmichael, James Foreman, all those hot shot black intellectuals from up north who sat high and looked low on the country, ignorant Negroes, right, and were patronizing in their own way. They come to Mississippi 
with their sweat. Can you imagine that? I've got to do the right. You're Stokely Carmichael. And if you knew anything about Stokely, right? Oh, tall, black, pretty, just gorgeous, right? Walking around with swag. As these poor white guys try to understand, who the hell is he? He comes down here like he owns the county. There was not an appreciation for the suffering and the existential crisis of these people's lives. And King, in contrast to the kids, understood that. And he said, we're not going to use fancy language. We're not going to talk down to these people. We are going to do our best to relate to them because, and this is very deep, because he actually genuinely loved them. <clears throat> Based on a revolutionary Christian ethic that says you love your enemy. This is very powerful. This is a revolutionary concept. This inspired, animated his understanding. And what I want to suggest moving forward, we've got King in Montgomery. We have King moving throughout the South. We have King in Washington where he gives the great speech, where he's talking about the Declaration of Independence. And he combines that with prophetic religion, a la Abraham Heschel. Right? And he, he's putting this stuff together, and he's synthesizing it, and producing art. We were talking about aesthetics in Smith. I'm going here by some art. Listen to that. I have a dream speech one time. There's some art for you. you know, and, and, and there's one great period where, where he's preaching, and he's on the manuscript. So he's working the manuscript. Then Mahalia Jackson, she was a singer, y'all. Mahalia Jackson leans over and says, tell him about the dream, Martin. Tell him about the dream. And, and she hollers. King then simply moves the paper to the side as he goes into his peroration, right? The thing that's going to redefine the world for people. And then he walks off into that dream. That was genius. An intellectual, connected to religion. It was the repudiation of faith by the young intellectuals and Turks in 1965, which doomed the black movement, as it became secular, angry, imprudent, and not strategic. Let's move forward. I first become aware of Tillos, 73, Philadelphia. I was a community organizer at the time. And I was involved in a movement <coughs> against violence organizing against black organized crime groups, but working in collaboration with the Angelo Bruno family of Philadelphia. And the group was actually a black Muslim group that had cut a deal with Angelo Bruno. And we were attempting to adapt the King model to the North, because King really didn't know how to engage the North. So when he moves from the South to sh South, to Chicago, Los Angeles, and Philadelphia, he was out of his element. Telos. <clears throat> I have here before me the 1983-84 edition. I read your review, the review of your book on Bloch, right, and his Marxism. Let me say this to you. During the early 70s, every possible social science left-wing journal in English, I read. New Left Review, uh, uh, Race and Class, uh, the Socialist History Workshop, uh, Theory and Society, every one of them, every doggone, and there were thousands of them at the time, right? So I'm climbing through this stuff because I knew that the black movement had completely self-destructed. In 1971, when they had the Attica Rebellion, we knew that they were coming in to kill all those men, and that the entire thing was ill-conceived. There was no way they were going to win. It was going to be a terrible tragedy. I am observing all of these events through the eyes of faith, as an intellectual. When Fred Hampton and Mark Clark were executed in 1969 in Chicago, I cried because Hampton was my age and they shot him 98 times. I 
understood then that the nature of what was confronting the black community, because we had abandoned King, to, to, to declare war on the mother country, and thought with a leather jacket, a tam, and a shotgun, we were going to take, we were going to challenge and fight and prevail over Babylon. We were destroyed. It was a lesson. I was a kid in the Pentecostal church, and I'd go to all night prayer because that's what you do when you're in the Pentecostal church. You go to all night prayer on Friday night. It's part of your spiritual discipline. And it's that intensity. In fact, it's that intensity that y'all are witnessing now. I prayed 50 years ago. The prayers are still carrying me through, right? And I began to read Telos. As I said, in 73. And it was encouraging because of the level of sophistication. As I said, it didn't have to be right all the time, but it conducted a level of discourse which tr transcended all of the homogenized, recycled, you know, sectarian nonsense, which was guaranteed to go absolutely nowhere. So we go from partisan review to Martin Luther King, and then I want to draw another connection as I wrap this up. Martin Luther King was the product of a social teaching tradition, a political theology, which had been created by Benjamin Mays, who was the president of Morehouse College. There was, and I want, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to hear this. There was an extraordinary collection of black intellectuals who had been trained at the University of Chicago, uh, 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 Benjamin Mays had gone to Bates College, having come from Mudbone, South Carolina, living in a, a one-room shack, who prevailed from nothing, based and rooted in his faith. The world, the poor, need a vision of faith that can enhance their sense of possibilities. You know, talk about the politics of hope. What we need is a recovery of the most revolutionary ideas that have animated the best of the Christian faith. One need not believe in it. A Bayard Rustin uh, uh, and all of the counselors of King didn't share King's evangelical black actor's faith, but they understood the genius of it. I'm very thankful to Telos for the extraordinary work that you've done. Your impact is actually more considerable than you realize. I'm very thankful, and I want to encourage you. I have every reason to believe that the best days of Telos can be before them, because the crisis is so substantial and is in such desperate need of tough, creative, unsentimental ideas. We have a, a real opportunity taking Tilo seriously to provide the theoretical and philosophic basis for resurrecting faith and hope for a generation of the future for whom faith and hope has died. Thank you very much. Side, right? 
you know, you know, I'm just a Jewish dude, you know, and, and we'll talk about the 40s. I stay in my little thing. I stay in my little corner of the world, right? And I, I run with the people that I know. It would, it would have been just a, a difficult experience. You know, and, and I have nothing, I, I, you know, I, I get that, right? I get, I can imagine an, an awkward conversation. You got Phillips and Rob, and they're in a meeting with Langston Hughes and, and Richard Wright, and Wright's in a bad mood that day. That could have been a difficult conversation, for which they were not prepared. So my sense is that there needed to be some translation, there needed to be some settings where one would naturally socialize, because the first time you meet a person, you don't want that to have to be a major, epic, you know, race, race discussion, <laughs> which is not going to lend itself to people wanting to get together again. It's like Bobby Kennedy, there's a famous Bobby Kennedy meeting, right, where Bobby Kennedy calls in uh, James Baldwin, Lorraine Hansberry, Harry Belafonte, and they meet in Kennedy's, apartment, you know, Upper East Side apartment, right? And Kennedy thinks, you know, it's going to be, you know, they're just going to blow kisses at him, right, because he's with Bobby Kennedy, right? Well, what happens is, oh, poor Bobby Kennedy, and they lit him up. As they say, they told him a new one. And they were not impressed that they were, and see, that was very interesting about the Kennedys, right? So some of the Irish class thing. They thought that the black people that they knew in Boston who were doormen and cooked their food and all that, 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 that was the same crap. Oh, no, 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 no. These people are not impressed with you Kennedys because they know your daddy and they know where that comes from. So you're not coming in here and trying to play no class thing with your crude vulgar self, right? And so you're sitting there with, but listen, Lorraine Hansberry, no, oh, no, honey, oh, no, dear. Now, I don't know where you think you come from, and I know you're the crude, vulgar, criminal daddy. You're not going to talk down to us. So it didn't go well. So needless to say. So, what, so my sense is, you know, uh, some of the, so it's, it's the 40s. It's the 40s. Black people were not naturally socializing around productive things. I mean, they might have gone to the cotton club, but that was a different game. You were looking for something else, and not intellectual discourse. Does that make sense? So, yeah. Um, I mean, you know, one, one thing that strikes me about um, you know, Martin Luther King and sort of his milieu is that, you know, when you're talking about, um, you mentioned the president of Morehouse and also of Howard, right, that these were uh, people who, I guess, his parents had been slaves, right? I mean, that, that's, that's kind of the story of upward mobility, um, very remarkable upward mobility taking place. See, right? fascinating question. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm going to throw you a curveball to complicate this. Benjamin Mays, daddy was a slave. Okay, you know, single shack, outhouse, I mean, right? right? Um, Mordecai Johnson comes from an upper middle class, light skinned black family where the parents had gone to college. I have this weird experience, you know, my mom and dad separated uh, when my father was a student at the Museum School of Fine Arts, and I find out later that uh, my grandfather had gone to college and had an advanced degree uh, from South Carolina State in 1924. So that's not, that's a, a different class thing. Now, so you had a mixed bag. You have uh, Benjamin Mays. Listen, Martin Luther King's grandfather was a preacher, right? Um, his, and and they had been educated. So there was an interesting black elite class of very educated people that nobody knew about. <laughs> But this black elite class never messed with white people because they weren't going to put up with it and didn't need them, right? And so most blacks didn't know that there, there was the black, look, Du Bois, Du Bois, oh my God, right? In the 1890s, uh, uh, Great Barrington, Massachusetts, he goes to Fisk to get his first BA. The white people say, Negro, we're not sure. You know, <laughs> it's funny. So Du Bois gets another PA from Harvard. And then when someone says, oh, you'll love this, someone says, oh my God, you went to Harvard. He says, the honor was purely theirs. <laughs> yeah, I love that, right? What's going on with that, right? <laughs> you know, with a stick and like spats and the whole thing, right? So, 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 so for the black community in the 30s and 40s, you've got these black elite intellectuals, they're very smart, and they learn. Then, Negro, there's such a thing as being too smart. So you're going to watch yourself. Mm -hmm. You're going to watch yourself, right? Because, boy, you can end up in the back of a truck in Harlem. 
Because you talk about your constitutional rights when you come out that club, and that Polish and Irish cop, you know, it don't barely speak English themselves, and then you say something clever, and then you get cracked across the head, right? So, oh no. So, it's, it, and see, this is the thing. It's a complicated reality, and, and moving forward, there are a series of discussions that are high level, and there are adult conversations about race where you're not talking with black people that have these kind of Shaka Zulu platitudes that are ridiculous. You know they're ridiculous, and you don't tell them because you know you don't want to upset the people when they say something stupid. I can see Wayne in the next. <laughs> right. So, so it, it's a complicated game now. Yes. So you're suggesting that um, that really the movement faltered when it turned its back on when it rejected religion when it became angry. Oh, no question. So, what's the way forward? Because ultimately, the reason I think why black power and other things emerge is people got tired of seeing black people getting beaten by the police, yeah. getting yeah. Oh, I agree. Um, you know, police dogs sick on them and the like, right? Uh, it, it's not that different than it is today. I mean, you know, agree. Was it two days ago where a, man, a black man sleeping in his car was shot by six officers because he was asleep in his car. No, I understand. Right? I mean, and, and, and social media brings this you know, to everybody's desktop, to their, the to their laptop, right? So, so, so how? I mean, it, I love this question. We we faltered. We we lost faith. If if your thesis see, is correct, see, because see, we saw that we were the only ones being Christian. Okay, let's take that. Let's take that. I'm gonna take that. And my daughter, she's always on the right. See, that, that's my favorite. <laughs> okay, I got it. See, let's do it this way. Now, all right, 65. 1965. Uh, 1965. 65. Right? You get the Civil Rights Act, right? No, no, Voting Rights Act is 65. It's 64, right? And what happens, it's tough. George Foreman and the guys after the Selma March, right, uh, are really getting frustrated because, you know, uh, they were beating up people. They killed, uh, was it Willie Jackson, who was one of the marchers? They shoot him in a restaurant in front of his father. So there's all this stuff. That's, that's going on. Now, this is the dilemma of reading the, rereading the history carefully. At the point at which we got there, it took superhuman strength to resist the temptation to surrender to the, the violence card. Because in some sense, I'm, I'm going to get real deep here, in some <coughs> sense that was a trick. Because once I lost my capacity, to keep myself cool. And I told that cracker where to go. And you know, he, he, he goes for his trigger and I grab the bat. We lost. We lost. Just think about what happens. I'm not saying it was necessarily avoidable. Now I'm gonna go where most king people just do king. No, it may have been an avoid, an avo it was a tragedy. You know, there's a, there's a thing called human tragedies where it was just an unavoidable thing. It was, it was not an unforced error. So in the history, when, uh, so that's 65. But if you're correct that most of, that, that not everyone around him believed as he believed. That's true. It, it wasn't unavoidable. They were seeing the same heads being cracked, right? And yeah. not everybody was committed to nonviolence in the way that came out. But, but see, this Nor is, could they? Oh, I agree, but see, this is the problem. If that's the case, and you want to play the game like that in real time, on the ground, there's going to be blood. Yes. No, if you're going to play the game, there's going to be more. No, no, and, and and there were children. He was putting children on. And see, this is the thing you got to ask yourself. Look, I'm 17 when King gets his face shot off. I'm 17, and I remember as they burned down West Philadelphia. I'm driving through West Philly, and it was a movie. Mm -hmm. Got it? Mm -hmm. And the whole country goes up. Yeah. Got it? Yeah. I, the, the young guys who were mentoring me, the alienation was so pronounced that they wanted to, they put up George Wallace <coughs> for president campaigns because they had said, blanket, let's do war. A whole generation of young men in the height of that says it's war. There were some junior high school kids, just so you get a sense of this, people, in my junior high school, Raymond Crawford, conspired with Willie, Willie Williams and them to kidnap Frank Rizzo 
the mayor of Philadelphia in exchange for Angela Davis. I come by to see them and they're in the basement, got the shotguns and the, the whole thing, right? I said, Angela, that's crazy, man. What are y'all talking about? Dude, they will kill Rizzo and you. You will not get out of here. Dude, you don't understand, man. We're doing something else, dude, right? No, 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 no. And what it inspired them is that Jonathan Jackson tried to uh, uh, kidnap a judge and a jury in Marin County, California. So they got the shotgun and with the around the judge's neck and they're dragging out these white women, child. Now I would have assumed with the white women they'll get passed. Duh! Those cops murdered everybody. They killed the judge, the white women, Jonathan Jackson, and these guys, my friends, were gonna take their shot and kidnap it for everyone. No, you have to understand. See, the period is uns. Unspeakably, inconceivably insane. Like right now. No, no, it's not. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. Professor? Doc, I wasn't there. See, you're a good black woman. See, no, 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 I got no, 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 that was slick. That was good, right? black woman slick. I got you. No, that was I got you, no, 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 no. No, no, I, I got it. No, no, all I'm saying is that there is now, King is the only philosophic, iconic, <laughs> which most people, most black people don't know the King thing for real. We got a, a McDonald's commercial, 20 seconds, every January 15th. Read the first part of the I Have a Dream speech. No, I got it. I came to cash a check. Right, the, the, the whole check thing. And so all I'm saying is that Telos is in a position to lead a series of discussions internationally about how to think about this thing. Yes, David. So um, I really liked your account of King as somebody who really empathized with uh, the poor whites. Yeah. Right? And, and, and you, you kind of emphasized the way that was in contrast to <coughs> uh, other black and black. Oh, absolutely. And so you know what you're indicating that to me is that <coughs> In some sense, what King was, you know, kind of represents for us now, is in a strange way uh, a kind of uh, well, like like Lincoln yes. was 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 insisting on the fact of the union of the United States that Come it's on. all one thing, Woo. all one country. Uh, you almost preached in there. <laughs> 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 That's exactly right. And, 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 and get the beauty of that. Get the beauty of that. You never heard King denounce the Civil War. For all his pacifism, you know, he never denounced the Civil War. He knew what that was, right? And they had exhausted Lincoln's other, there were no, no options, right? And then Fort Sumter, oh no, oh hell no. Oh no, 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 no. You want to talk government property? I'm going to let that go. Oh no, we're not going to let that go, right? Now, get this. And I'll sit down on this. Get. When King launches SCLC, oh, this is so wild, right? The first thing was, all of the left-wing advisors that saw all the activity coming out of Montgomery said, we're going to call it the Southern Leadership Council. Right? Southern Leadership Council. Right? <laughs> King's sitting in a chair, and he, he drops his head. Like, oh, <coughs> hell no. <laughs> He gets up and he says, it's going to be the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And this silence. They had a bunch of secular left-wing New York types, right? I think they know everything, right? Southern Christian Leadership Conference because King understood in the deepest way. So they're writing the charter, you know, for what the thing's going to be. So King's Southern Christian, then he's, he gets up and he says, the real goal of this movement is to redeem the soul of America. Woo! You can't beat that with a stick. I'm not trying to get rights for colored people. I'm not trying to be black. 
I'm trying to realize the dream of Lincoln, the Declaration of Independence, the best that America can be. That's so revolutionary. And it's, yes, 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 please. Wait. Could you just push it a bit further because that's terrific. Can you go to the core of that conference? Because in our conference there's a wobble that's between right. religion, that's right. sympathy for the sacred, that's right. and, that's exactly and right. faith. That's right. And people exactly. talking don't seem to know which one they mean. But what you've done that's very strong right. is point to the aspect of his faith right. that doesn't lead to junk religion, no. and that's does right. lead to real action, that's right. and does actually redeem the soul of America, that's right. because that's right. it sees what the soul is. Yes. So you go to the prophecy, yeah. which has been lost. Boom, boom, boom. See, see, see. <laughs> then you get into it. I'm like, I sit down now. I lose the church. Well, I sit down. Girl. Look, what he does. This is so wild. It's one of the seven Christian leaders of conference. No jump religion. In fact, I don't <coughs> do jump religion. I don't even understand jump religion, right? <laughs> he is channeling. He is channeling Heschel's work on the prophets. It's not come out yet. But he's reading early drafts, right, on Amos. Yes. And so he's got some deep stuff in his, pro his philosophically grounded political theology <coughs> at the most sophisticated level. You understand? And so you're absolutely right. So, and, 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 that be and, and, and see, this is the thing. It wasn't cynical. That's the other part of it. This just could have been some, some marketing guy, yes, right? So, yeah, go ahead, dear. No, uh, the, uh, we talked yesterday yeah. about Purse and Royce and King. You and killed it, right? <laughs> no, and one of the reasons I was interested in that in the Telos Journal yep, yep. Um, um, was both Purse and Royce, who affected the personalist, right. you know, Doctor right. Doctor King, under yep. understood concepts of unity in cosmology as a theology. Ooh. These were the theological pragmatists who understood right. that the multiplicity of human effort. Um, coming towards the absolute, the mind, the one, whatever you want to call it, is a theologi Christian theological precept. That's correct. And that grounded your question, Wayne. Yeah. That, gr that grounded King. And that's why his economics completely appreciated the way black labor undermined <sighs> the working class and lower middle class whites, right. and why he was able to connect his uh, politics to things like the Vietnam War yeah. and the uh, and the American class system and why he was shut down in his own movement. Yeah, that's right. right? And it, even like people like Bayard Rustin and some show, don't do that. Don't make those connections. You will lose your connections with the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. And King said, I don't care. This is right because it was grounded in that kind of level of right. um, the. Uh, of theological notion that's, that's of right. what unity yeah. really means philosophically. And see, and see, just wrapping up on your point, uh, the story is King is in Jamaica to write, work on the draft of the next book. He gets to the airport, he's on his way out. Uh, he picks up Ramparts. Ramparts cover the story of the Napalm Hill. You guys know the story, right? Uh, it's, he, he can't sleep at night. He gets back, he says, I can't do it. This is, he knew there was an argument to be made not to go there, right? Uh, Rustin and all the guys, there was a rational, pragmatic, that's real argument not to go there. The, his, his fidelity to the principal thing, and what's indisputable is he said, how can I tell young black men not to be violent in gangs? How can I talk, how can I lecture black people and wave my finger in the face of black people and not have the courage to stand up and tell those guys in, in D.C. I can't tell that kid not to be violent if I can't condemn you when you're murdering hundreds of thousands of people, defenseless people. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. <laughs>